Over the last two weeks, we've been working our way through the Apostles' Creed. And our goal in this series is to get rooted, to get anchored in the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the Scriptures. And what we've said is that times of peaceful circumstances are not the norm for the church. Historically, across the world, times of peaceful circumstances in culture are not the norm, they are the exception. And the thing that has kept the church anchored and rooted over the last 2,000 years has been this reality that they knew the word of God, that they understood the truth of the scriptures, they were rooted in that truth, and so when the waves of culture came crashing against the church, they were anchored, they were strong, they were able to withstand those storms because they knew what they believed and why they believed it. And we started this series by focusing on the first two words of the creed, which say, I believe. And we talked about the importance of your beliefs being rooted in the truth. And we live in a world today where it's a common sentiment for somebody to say, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And there are alternative facts, right? And the question that we asked is, what do you do with somebody who comes up and says, not I am a truth that you can choose to accept or reject. He comes and says, I am the truth. We looked at the fact that there is a objective, universal truth that exists in the world, and his name is Jesus. In other words, all other truths bow to Jesus. All other realities bow to Jesus, that he is the truth, and you must be anchored and rooted in him if you're gonna be able to navigate the storms of life. Last week, we tackled the first article of the creed, and we talked about what it means for God to be our Father, what it means to be invited into relationship with God, not as a boss and we are his employees, but as a loving, good, and perfect Father, and we get to come into relationship with him as his children, that Jesus Christ, that his finished work has given us the right to become children of God, and it's an incredible invitation. Today we're gonna read the creed aloud together again, and what we've said in the previous weeks is in this series we are not preaching the Apostles' Creed, we are preaching the Bible. We're not preaching the Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed has no authority other than what it has derived from the scriptures itself. And so we are preaching the scripture. The, The Apostles' Creed is our framework for the series, the scripture is our authority, so we are preaching the Bible. Now, whenever the creed is read aloud together in a community, we've said it is a rebellion against the unbiblical ideologies and worldviews of our day, and it is, again, aligning ourselves with King Jesus and his kingdom. It's a reminder that we are ambassadors, not for the kingdoms of men. We are ambassadors for the kingdom of God to the kingdoms of men. So that's what's happening when we read the creed aloud together collectively. The other thing that we said is there's this little phrase in the Apostles' Creed, I'm gonna say it again, the Holy Catholic Church, when we say I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, Grace Chapel is not becoming Catholic, that word Catholic means universal. It means universal. So we're saying we believe in the capital C church, meaning every follower of Jesus throughout human history, that is the church that we believe in. All right, we good with that? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand together. Again, we're gonna read the Apostles' Creed together. If you're watching online at home, you can stand with us wherever you're at. You can stand, and uh, listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, and the idea of reading some ancient creed aloud together with a bunch of strangers completely weirds you out, that's totally fine. You can stand and watch the rest of us be weird together, and that will be very entertaining for you. So we're gonna read the creed aloud together. We are going to reject the unbiblical ideologies of our day, and again, we're gonna align ourselves with Christ and his kingdom. This is the Apostles' Creed. Let's read this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, amen. Good job, you did it, way to go. <clears throat> All right, so today we're digging into the article of the creed that tackles the birth, the life, the suffering, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. So I hope you're ready for a four and a half hour sermon today. There's no way we can cover all of that today, and what we are gonna cover with the time that we've got is we're gonna take a look at the incarnation of Christ, the suffering of Christ, and the ascension of Christ, the often overlooked ascension of Christ. Let's talk about the incarnation. The incarnation of Christ, it's what we celebrate at Christmas, it's the, the Christian doctrine that the creator of the universe put on human flesh, descended down into humanity, and walked among us. It's this absolutely radical, incredible idea that God put on a human body and walked among us. It's incredible, and we read about this in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, and uh, in case you brought your Bible and you want to follow along, our root text for today's message is going to be Philippians 2, 6 through 11. So that's where we're going to be camped out today. But this is what it says in verse 6 and 7. It says, though he, Jesus, was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. It, it's this idea that the creator of the universe, of everything that you've ever known and experienced, everything that has ever existed, the creator entrusted himself to the creation, that he was born in the likeness of men. He came down as a human baby. It's this idea that this infinite, all-powerful, eternal God limited himself to a specific time and place in the first century world. It's the idea that the supernatural became natural. The full divinity of God and the full nature of man found itself in Jesus Christ. And it's not 50% God, 50% man. It's this theological term called the hypostatic union. I'm gonna qu quiz you about that next week. The hypostatic union, it means that the, the, in Jesus Christ you have 100% God and somehow 100% man in the same person. That is the incarnation that God put on human flesh. And what's interesting about this idea is at Christmas time, we, uh, we associate all these warm, fuzzy feelings with the incarnation of Christ. Right? God put on human flesh, walked among us, good tidings, great joy, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and, and rightfully so, it's great news. But have you ever stopped to think about how radically offensive the incarnation is? how wildly in your face offensive the incarnation is, the indictment that it makes about the human condition. N.T. Wright poses the question, he says, how can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human, that the fire has become flesh, that life itself has walked into our midst? And he says this, it is the most devastating disclosure of the deepest reality in the world. Now, what is he talking about? What is the incarnation disclosing? What is it, it revealing? What, what is it, uh, what's devastating about it? Well, I want to answer it this way. Whenever you think about the other founders of other religions, what's really interesting when you pay attention to it is the similarities they have to one another and the stark contrast that they all have with Christianity. It's, it's amazing to see. And in Buddhism, for example, Buddha says, if you really want to be saved, if you really want salvation, you can achieve salvation through enlightenment. By emptying yourself of yourself, by achieving nirvana, you can be saved if, if that's how you practice it, through enlightenment. Now, Muhammad, on the other hand, says, you can be saved, you can achieve salvation through submission. You can get it through submission and obedience to the will of Allah. Now, Buddha and Muhammad, what's interesting is they don't agree on how to find salvation, 
So one says enlightenment, the other one says submission and obedience. So they don't agree on how to find enlightenment, but they do agree on this one thing, that you can achieve salvation. That you yourself, on your own, in your own power, can achieve, can find, can obtain salvation, and that's not what Christianity says at all. That's not the message of Christianity because Christianity says the darkness in our heart is so dark and so deep, our motives are so tainted and twisted with sin that we're blind to it oftentimes. We don't even realize the depth of our own selfishness and sin. And for that reason, there's nothing that we can do about the condition of sin. There's nothing that we can do in order to achieve or obtain salvation. There's nothing we can add to it. There's nothing we, we can't manage it. We can't mitigate it. We can't do anything about our condition. We are totally and utterly helpless and hopeless on our own. That, by the way, is the message of the incarnation. Because God looked in on our condition and saw it, and in his mercy, in his infinite compassion, he decides that he's gonna come down because he knows we can't achieve salvation, we can't earn our way up to salvation, so he's gotta bring it down to us. That's the incarnation. See, it's an indictment to any modern person. You walk up to them and say, man, you have no idea how selfish and sinful you actually are. You can't do anything about your condition. They're not gonna be very happy with you. That's the message of the incarnation, by the way. That our sin is so bad, so horrendous, so heinous, that God literally had to put on human flesh and come down and walk among us. See, and God saw us in that condition and was not content to leave us that way. See, all, all the other religions, God remains distant. And he says, now you have to perform, you have to achieve, you have to behave in all the right ways and do all the right things. And then maybe you'll be accepted into my good graces. There's no guarantee. But only Christianity says, no, God came down to you because you couldn't make your way to him. And in fact, when you place your trust in him, when you place your faith in him, there is a guarantee. The Holy Spirit, the seal of our inheritance. See, Jesus Christ brings salvation to us. He came down to save us from the condition of sin. Now, it's not only that, because look at this. Jesus Christ, listen, and some of us need to hear this today. Jesus Christ didn't come to call all the moral, obedient, upstanding, righteous people and rally them to his banner, his cause, in order to fight off all the bad, immoral people out there. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus doesn't come and say, okay, all of you righteous people rally around me and we'll finally deal with all those bad, lost, confused, immoral people once and for all. We'll take care of them, don't you worry about it. That's not the message of Christ. The message of Christ to humanity is this, every single one of you is filled to the brim with selfishness and sin. Every single one of you is in desperate need of salvation from yourself and from the condition of sin. Your hearts, your motives are so twisted, you can't save yourself. I didn't come to show you how you can achieve salvation. That's not what I came to do. I came to bring salvation to you. And in light of that reality, look, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to wage war against lost people. I don't want you to wage war against confused, immoral people. Listen, here's why. Some of the most important words in the whole Bible. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. And it's funny how we as Christians, we get saved and we come to know Jesus and all of a sudden, you know, we go to this other side of the spectrum and we think, okay, now I'm moral and now I'm obedient and now I'm good and now I'm deserving of salvation and all those immoral people, yeah, we're done with you. Look, that's not Jesus. I don't know what that is. That's not Jesus. Because the message of Jesus is every single one of us is in desperate need of salvation and in desperate need of grace every day, every moment of every day. Therefore, our calling is not to wage war against lost, disobedient, confused, immoral people. Our calling, church, according to Jesus, is to love them as I have loved you. 
pursue them as I have pursued you. And Jesus even says this in John 20, 21. He says, as the Father has sent me, even so, I'm sending you. You know what that means? It means that you and I, as the body of Christ, individually and collectively, here's what this means. It means that we, as the church, we don't run away from messy people, we run toward messy people. It means we don't protect ourselves from the broken people of the world, it means we go love the broken people of the world. We pursue the lost, the hurting, the needy, the confused, the immoral, the people that we would consider to be our enemies. It means we go after them with the love of Christ. Not as some weird project where we're trying to convert them at every turn. No, we go and love them as Christ has loved us. See, how has the Father sent the Son? Whatever the answer is to that question, that's how we are to be sent out into the world. To look like Christ to fulfill the mission of Jesus in the way Jesus fulfilled the mission. It means that as a church body, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you, it means that as a church body collectively, we're gonna continue to plant churches, we're gonna continue to send missionaries, we're gonna continue to support mission work all around the world, we are gonna continue to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We are going to do that collectively, but hear me, that does not alleviate our individual responsibility to love our neighbors as ourselves. As an individual follower of Jesus, that is your calling. And if you are going to do that, it requires patience, it requires commitment, it requires you to suffer, it requires you to swallow your pride. Sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus says, you couldn't climb your way up to me, so I came down to you. The calling of every single Christian is an incarnational calling. It's about the mission. Jesus came down for us, and he sends us out into the trenches, out to go get and go love and go pursue messy people out in the world. That's what we're called to, and that requires patience and commitment, and it requires suffering. So let's talk about the suffering of Christ because that's exactly what he did. In Philippians 2, 8, it says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the writer of Hebrews says it like this. In Hebrews 2, 9, it says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Now notice it does not say here that he was crowned with glory and honor in spite of his suffering of death. It says that he was crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering and death. How? Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation Perfect through suffering. That word founder, it carries significant meaning. And in the original Greek language, it's the word archagos. And it carries this meaning of a champion, captain, founder, finisher, author. Right? And and here's what this alludes to. A hero or a champion. It was somebody that engaged in battle as a substitute. So, for example, the Israelites are facing off with the Philistines. The Philistines have Goliath. The Israelite army is terrified out of their mind. King Saul is terrified out of his mind. And all of a sudden, this unlikely champion comes forward and wins the victory. Who is the champion? It's David. David. He is the champion, which this is a side note, by the way. And look, I I get why... Preachers have done this in the past. Can, I just want to offer this to you. You are not David. David is not a picture of you or who you're supposed to be. David is a picture of Christ. Do you know who you are in the story? We're the Israelite army terrified out of our minds. That's us. 
So you're not David. You were never supposed to be David. Jesus is David. Jesus, he faces our giant for us. He faces down death for us. He conquers the greatest enemy for us so that we might be delivered from further humiliation and death itself. That's Jesus. So you're not David. I love you. You're not David. You were never meant to be David. But Jesus Christ, listen, he stepped in and he destroyed death for us. How did he do it? Through death. He destroyed death by death. Through suffering, death. Our captain, our champion has dealt the final blow to death hell, sin, and the grave once and for all through his own suffering and his own death. That's the kind of God we have. No other religion comes close to giving us anything like that. Only Jesus, only Christianity, that's who our champion is. He's one who stands between you and your greatest enemy. You and the one who seeks to devour your whole life, to steal, to kill, destroy. The one, listen, the one who tempts you to sin. And then if you fall into that trap, who, who looks at you and says, I can't believe you would do that. How could you do such a horrible thing? And shoves your face in the mud and reminds you and tells you that you'll never matter. You're not valuable. Nobody cares. Nobody loves you. You're gonna be abandoned and rejected. Nobody loves you. The one who says all of those things, Jesus stands in between you and him and says, hey, if you wanna get to him or her, you gotta go through me first. You're not laying a hand on him. You're not laying a hand on her. You gotta come through me. That's who Jesus is. That's who our champion is. That's our hero. This week, just on a personal front, you guys, I've experienced the heaviest spiritual attack that I think I've had since I've been a follower of Christ in the last week. And I'm not surprised I'm not surprised. And as I was studying for this message, I felt like the, the Lord just reminded me. He goes, you know what? The devil is terrified. Amen. He is absolutely terrified, and this is true for every single one of us. He is scared out of his mind of what will happen if you come to fully realize who you are in Christ Amen. and who Christ is in you. Pastor Steve and Sarah have been doing their morning devotions, which have been incredible, by the way, and it's all about your identity in Christ. Like when you wake up in the morning and your feet hit the floor, the devil is scared out of his mind of what you're gonna do that day for the kingdom. He's terrified. And so of course he's gonna attack. Of course he's gonna tempt. Of course he's gonna remind you of, of your wounding and, and of your brokenness to get you discouraged and down and depressed. But here's the deal. He's doing that because he's absolutely scared out of his mind of Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's terrified of what you could accomplish if you fully realize who you are in Christ. See, when you see what Jesus has done for you, when you see his suffering, when you see what he's gone through, you see the, the grief and the sorrow, you realize that Jesus isn't just some unrelatable deity that has no idea what it's like to be hum human. You realize that he has walked through the valley with you. He is for you. He's never gonna leave you or forsake you. He's not against you. He's with you in every valley. He's with you on every mountain and everywhere in between. That's who Jesus is. But the story of Jesus doesn't just end there. He didn't just die. He rose again. Amen. See, in the resurrection, it's been said, the resurrection is the linchpin of the entire Christian faith. If the resurrection didn't happen, if Easter didn't happen, then Christmas didn't matter. Right, if the resurrection didn't happen, then the incarnation didn't matter. Right, and... and the, the incarnation failed, and if the resurrection didn't happen, then our faith is completely in vain. That's true, but let me just offer you this, and we're, I'm gonna stretch this a little bit this morning. If it all ends at the resurrection, if it ends there, if the story ends at the resurrection, we're saved, 
but we still have a problem. So let's talk about the ascension of Christ. The Apostles' Creed, it says, it highlights this, which I love. It says, he, Jesus, ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And I love that the creed doesn't do what many modern evangelical churches do today, and we overlook the importance of this essential Christian doctrine. And it's hugely important because directly after the resurrection of Jesus, he appears to Mary Magdalene. And there's this really interesting exchange between the two of them because Mary is standing at the tomb and she's weeping. And she's weeping, one, because her rabbi was killed, and two, because his body is missing from the tomb. And she doesn't know where Jesus has gone, where the body went. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears to her and she runs to him and she clings to him. She hugs him. And she's so excited to, to see him that he's alive. Like, how could this be? How could this happen? And you would think in that moment that Jesus would be like, I know, it's crazy. It happened. I'm risen from the dead. Surprise, you know. But that's not what Jesus says. Look what he says in John 20, 17. He says, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father. So Jesus basically looks at her and goes, woman, get off me. I got things to do. And then earlier in John 16, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away, He's speaking to his disciples. And if you or I are the disciples in that moment, we're asking how in the world could it possibly be better for you to go away? Like we've put all our hopes in you. Where are you going? How could it be better? And here's what they didn't yet understand. The ascension of Jesus has at least three hugely impactful implications for every single follower of Christ, for every single one of us. Number one, without the ascension, we have salvation, but no power. We have salvation. It's available to us, but we don't have power. The rest of John 16, 7, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So if Jesus doesn't ascend to the Father, we don't receive the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, the thing that enables us to fulfill the mission that Christ has called us to. It means that we have a calling, but we have no method to accomplish that calling. It means that we have a mission, but no means. So if it all ends at the resurrection, then we have salvation, but we don't have power. Number two, the ascension means that Christ's presence is eternally accessible. It means that, and we've talked about this before, that Jesus is no longer limited to a specific time and place in human history. The, the ascension means that Jesus, look, when he's telling Mary, let me go, I haven't yet ascended to my father, what he's essentially telling Mary is, you're afraid that if you let me go, you're gonna lose me, but I'm telling you, if you let me go, you'll never be able to lose me again because my presence will be with you forever. My spirit, my Holy Spirit will be with you forever. No matter where you go, I'm with you, right? That's what the ascension means. That's that Christ is now accessible to people of every tribe, every nation, every tongue throughout the history of the world forever. That's what the ascension means. And number three, the ascension means, uh, the ascension of Jesus means that every knee will bow. You know, one, one of the questions I've had over the years about the ascension is, like, why, why that? Like, why the ascension? Like, you, you rise up into the clouds and disappear into the heavens. Was it like Superman? Like, what, what was that like? And imagine being the disciples sitting around, like, did you see that? What the, he, just he just went, shot up into the sky. Where did he go? Like, what would that have been like? And so, like, why that way? Why the ascension? Why is that the, the thing that Jesus chose to do? Now, this is speculation, and people much smarter than I am have uh, speculated this for, for some time. But something that's interesting to me is that all throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he's constantly saying, the kingdom is near, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is here. And he's constantly, that was his message. He was bringing the kingdom of God to the earth. The kingdom is here. And if there is a kingdom, then that means there is a king. 
And while he walked among us, we crowned Jesus with a crown of thorns. But if Jesus, if, if, uh, if he was crowned with the crown of thorns here at the ascension, where is he ascending to? He's ascending to the right hand of the Father, which means he's taking his place on what? On his throne. So if Jesus is ascending to his throne at the right hand of the Father, what that means is the ascension is a coronation ceremony. It's this beautiful moment where he has finished all his work that he, was, that he came to do, that he was sent to do, and the ascension is, is his coronation ceremony where he goes to his throne. And if I was Jesus, which I'm not, but if I was, I'm, th- I'm putting myself in his shoes, I'm thinking, man, okay, 33 years, patience, long-suffering, I mean, I fulfilled the work that Christ, that, that God gave me to do. I fulfilled my mission on earth. I suffered, I died, I rose again. Like, it all happened. I'm gonna show off a little bit and just shoot up into the sky. So maybe Jesus is showing off a little bit, but it's this dramatic moment, and what's happening is Jesus is taking his rightful place on his throne. He's taking his rightful place in the position of authority, dominion, power, glory, honor. That's what the ascension means. See, because of the incarnation that Christ became a man and walked among us, because of the suffering of Christ, because of the resurrection, look what our passage says in Philippians 2.9. It says, therefore, because of all of this, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and even under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, at the first coming, Jesus came as a suffering servant and in the second coming, he comes as a conquering king and when he does, every knee bows will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the question, the question for you is, have you confessed? Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Because one day he's coming back and you will do it then. The question is, have you done it now? Have you entrusted your life to the one who entrusted his life to you? Have you surrendered your life to the one who surrendered everything for you to prove his eternal love for you? Have you given your life to him? Do you see all that God gave for you, what he accomplished for you? And look, if you've never given your life to King Jesus or you've wandered from him and your relationship with him has gone cold, look, I would love nothing more than to talk with you after service here in a few minutes just to shake your hand, to welcome you and talk with you about what it means to give your life to Christ. Last week after second service, I offered that same thing and this wonderfully kind woman was patient, waiting, and she came up and we had a conversation and she said, look, I was the, I was the one person and I need to give my life to Jesus. And look, maybe that's you today. Maybe that's you. Or maybe you've wandered from him and maybe today is your day to come back to him. It's an open door. That's an open invitation. Not only from us as Grace Chapel, but from God in heaven. So make that decision today. Give your life to him. Come back to him. He's not looking on you with disappointment, with scorn, He's a loving father who wants to welcome you home. That's who God is. And for those of you who have trusted in Christ, the question for you is what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Is what we talked about today, is it just a nice, convenient truth for you to believe and and leave here on Sunday morning and it doesn't actually have any implications or requirements for your life? Is, Is, have you settled for a, country club Christianity, which there is no such thing, by the way. Have you settled for a missionless, purposeless life as a follower of Jesus? Does God, listen, this is an important question, does God have permission to do whatever he wants in your life? Have you given him permission or are you still on the throne of your life? Do you recognize him as the king of kings Or are you still trying to get yourself on that throne? 
When's the last time you stepped out in faith? When's the last time you took a risk for the glory of God? When's the last time you were radically generous or went out of your way for somebody that's far from God? When's the last time that you individually got in the trenches with somebody? When's the last time you ran toward that messy person or that person that just irked you? When's the last time you intentionally pursued somebody with the grace and love of Jesus? Because church, if there is a king, and there is, and we are a part of his kingdom, the question is, what assignment has your king given you to do? What mission has he given you? Whatever that is, let's get after that. Let's be about our father's business. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the calling that you've given us. Thank you for, God, just everything that you've done that we don't deserve. Thank you for the incarnation that you came and walked among us. Thank you that you suffered in my place, that you were the champion that stepped in between us and our enemy. God, and you defeated death, hell, and the grave so that we might be made new, we might become free and live on mission because of your great love for us. God, thank you. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the ascension. Thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit to empower us to live boldly in a world that is actively against your kingdom and your ways on the earth. And God, I pray for each one of us, God, that you would give us the grace, the patience, the commitment, the willingness to suffer for people that are far from you so that they might see you for who you truly are. And God, help us never forget that phrase, such were some of you. We love you, Lord. We need you. Without you, we can't accomplish the mission, so God, have your way, have your will in us and through us for the world's sake and for the expansion of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you soon.